It's a great honor to uh, speak again at CVBCon. Um, this is my second time after last year. Um, I'm, I've already seen a few familiar faces. It's a great honor, but also, you gotta imagine it's a great responsibility as well. And there's like, how many people in this room? 200? I don't know. 400? No, that would be. So let's say 200 people, and you're the best. Right? I mean, you're the best folks at your respective organizations. It's not like your employer went like, oh, Johnson is not doing his job. He's drinking all the time under his desk. <laughs> not writing one line of code. Let's send him to a conference. <laughs> no, you're the best. Now, you know, is STL here? Because he says he's going to be here. STL. Well, I see Chandler there. So Chandler's here. Imagine I play something like Inception on Chandler. I plant a really bad idea in his mind. He goes there and kind of spreads. I mean, here's the thing. If I give you a bad day today, there's 200 folks in here. I give you all a bad idea right now. And this could have consequences on the history of humankind. <laughs> it could, could rip a real bad, right? It could go like pretty consequential. So, uh, you know, I mean, picture this. Imagine like in 1960, there was this guy at the conference, he said, you know, there's the global variable, and it was good. <laughs> and then, think of that, right? It was, man, I don't want to be that guy. So it's a great responsibility to, anyhow. By means of introduction, oh, this of course doesn't work. Oh, it works better if it's turned on, right? Give me a second here. I like the most advanced programs in the world here, engineers and all that stuff, and uh, what? It does have a battery. Anyhow, well, I guess I'll go old school. Anyhow, by means of introduction here, there is no introduction slide because, you know, uh, in my academic career, I've been always been taught that a good talk goes like you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> and that was the standard, to no, I'm not kidding, that was the standard structure of a talk. But then I read this, uh, the secrets, the presentation secrets of Steve Jobs. And I was like, what, are you retarded? Why, why? Steve Jobs never has an introduction slide. Never. And indeed, I looked on the YouTube, has no introduction slide. So uh, they said, start with a story. Open with a story. Give a, give a story from your heart, from your soul. <laughs> tell, tell something that's true and connects you to the audience. And let me tell you something that's really connect me to you. To be very honest, I, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Let me qualify. Let me qualify that. I never want to be in the first like 45 minutes of any of my talks ever. I hate it. It's really bad. Like the first, like, the first minutes are really bad. Because it's all, it always goes like this. So picture this. Like, oh, would you come next year at the conference? Sure, it's six months from now, no problem. And then, you know, the months go by and the date approaches and you have no slides. <laughs> And then you know, there's this time compression, which is weird, like in the last hour, on the plane, after it landed. <laughs> right? There's an immense, pro there's a Dirac fun functional of productivity there, right there. Like, it's amazing. It goes to infinity, productivity. <laughs> and I get most of my slides done. And literally, I've had talks in which I finish my slides literally like two minutes before giving, before saying, this is my slide. Right? And I had the organizer in, like, behind me and saying, you know, Andre, maybe I should announce that this is not going to happen. <laughs> There's never been a talk I've ever given that I didn't want to wiggle myself out of. Out of. I've, there's always been a thought. I've never, like, done it. The, you know, good work ethics, what have you, like, you know, mom told me, well, all that good stuff, right? But there's always been the thought, if I just could wiggle out... I could be sick. <laughs> it happens, you know, airplanes, you know, delays, whatnot. 
So, well, and then this is what's going to happen, like this talk. This talk, we're going to go like this, we're going to move on, and 30 minutes into the talk, I'm going to have one of those, what they call them, extracorporeal experiences, ESP, ESP right? Experiences. So I'm going to see myself from like up there, talking, and you're listening, if you're not leaving, right? <laughs> and I'm going to like, this is working. I, they didn't leave. This is awesome. Right? By the way, who's, like, who's been, who's, for whom this is my first talk live? Oh, Jesus. Okay. So, <clears throat> I talked to John. I have bad news for you. I talked to John Carl. They don't give refunds. <laughs> so, take it easy, okay? So, that was my story for, as, did, did we connect here? Do we have a, <laughs> all right. So, let's start with practicalities. I challenge you to write a transactional file copy function. Let's write a file, a file function that, uh, you know, a file, hey John, something that either succeeds or fails successfully, right? It, all, it either copies the whole file or it doesn't copy anything, right? So I don't, what I don't want is a fraction of the file on the destination drive. Make sense? Again, like when I was doing research, the worst thing that would have happened was to have a file of data which was like, you know, I don't know, 800 megabytes. And then you copy it, and for whatever reason, you copy like 600 meg megabytes of it, and the data at the end would influence your results would be like between success and failure. It did happen, so this is awful, right? So you want to define a transactional copy, file copy function. Either you copy the whole file, or if you, if you don't succeed, you don't want the, you don't want the kind of a fragment of a file there. Great. I'll also give you a cheat sheet. Um, Boost has a great function, which is called copy file. That should be useful, right? All right, so we have a copy file, which has this path thing, which is like a string, but just, you know, smarter. And uh, this is what I got so far. Uh, well, first I'm going to uh, copy into a temporary file called the original file name, plus dot delete me, which is very indicative, which is like, you know, if you see it, delete it. Right? If you ever do ls in your directory and see it, it's gonna delete it, because it says so, right? <laughs> it begs for deletion. Great. So beef is uh, not by boy boyfriend's boost file system, right? But I didn't have room on the, right? Beefy path, so I'm going to create uh, two dot native the string, uh, I append delete me, and then I'm going to copy into the temporary file with uh, boost. And then I'm going to, again, use boost to rename the file from temporary to the final destination. But uh, the key thing here is what if that does, either of those operations doesn't succeed? And in that case, I want to remove the temporary, the delete me file. I don't want to leave some garbage in there, right? Sensible? Right, great. Well, notice that I'm using like the um, remove, I'm using the global one, the POSIX. Why do you think so? It doesn't throw. So I, I want to kind of do a best effort uh, thing to clean after myself, right? It's, I don't want to throw if it doesn't succeed because that's a disaster, right? So great, I'm you know, catching everything and throwing. And <clears throat> uh, you look at this function and you have, uh, if you're like me, critical, you see that it has like what, eight lines? How many of these lines do work? <laughs> uh, about three, right? There's the copy, there's the rename, there's the remove. And everything else is sort of noise. So I'm not happy about it. You know what? I don't like it. So, well, we have control flow and all that try and catch, you know, stuff going on. And, you know, all of the stuff is not dedicated to what I want to do. It's just, why do I throw, it's like you're at baseball and they throw and catch balls around and stuff, but it's not about the ball. It's about how they wear the hat while doing it. It does, it's, it's not the ball that's the subject here, right? So why am I talking about catching and throwing things? Actually, this kind of, if you take it, I could take offense at this. All right, catching everything, like there's a dot, dot, dot. It's like, you know what, I don't care. I'm catching everything there is. And you know what, I'm throwing everything there is. It's not even fair, right? To, from a moral stain, standpoint, right? And actually in Visual Studio, a while ago at least, it was kind of not nice to do so. Is that still the case, STL, of course? Uh, don't use EHA, it's evil. 
Yeah, you know, that kind of stuff, you see? And even he said, I'm Inception, right? <laughs> I'm doing Inception here. All right, so I don't like this. Great. <clears throat> well, uh, let's uh, move a bit forward with uh, composition. I'm marching forward. So I want to now define a transactional file move function, which either moves a file entirely or does move it at all. By the way, let me amend what I just said. Here, there's a one key point that's kind of lost in the translation here. Did you know that rename is atomic? It's kind of an important tidbit, huh, isn't there, right? In post, it's like, you know, rename is atomic on the file system. It, it either renames or doesn't, but it doesn't kind of stop somewhere in the middle. This is important, right? Good. With that in mind, let's move to the file rename thing. So, uh, well, here's what I come up with. Uh, it, it looks about the same, except I'm going to reuse my copy file transact. So I'm going to copy the file, and I'm going to remove the source. And if things fail, I'm going to uh, remove the destination. There is uh, some, that something doesn't sound right there. Like, I tried to copy this file. Uh, for whatever reason, I didn't succeed. For example, it was read-only, or you know, maybe the, the source was impossible to read because of a failure of some kind. And therefore, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to remove the destination, whatever the hell was in there. That doesn't sound like a nice thing, right? You see the bug? How do you fix it? Uh, how do you fix it? Come on, fix it for me. Fix, fi files are disappearing right now. <laughs> Things are, baby seals are dying. <laughs> and baby seals, I mean babies, like human babies who are supposed to be Marines when they grow up. It's not, okay? It's that bad, okay? So help me. Uh-huh, yes, then no. Move that one. Well, yeah, move the try and then one line. Thank you. I was thinking the other way around. Um, so I'm going to copy the file in transactionally first, and only after that works, I'm going to ask myself the philosophical question whether I want to remove the destination ever. Right? Good. Awesome. This is good, as far as I can tell. Baby seals are alive and safe. And uh, still, I'm just as unhappy as I was because, I mean, think of this. These are kind of trivial examples. They fit on a slide. I don't really care to make the font smaller. And you can see them from the back, right? So, um, but, you know, in real life, things can get hairy pretty quick, right? You have like five operations to do, and you have like all of these tries and catches, some, sometimes embedded one within the other. And what if I didn't have this remove guy in post six? I had to put a try catch inside the try catch, et cetera, right? So, Things are not, they don't look well. I don't like the way they look. So what do we have for improving the situation here, friends? Well, we have uh, RAII, which doesn't quite help because RAII like, executes that destructor no matter what. It doesn't execute the destructor conditionally. Uh, if things didn't go well, then let me destroy. Après moi, le deluge, right, etc. So it's not like that, right? So, scope guard is the same. It's like an ad hoc destructor. And when you compose things, as I said, it only makes things worse. So that's not, I, you know, it doesn't seem like it's leading us uh, somewhere. Meantime, CPP core standards, very nice. So, you know, you shouldn't try. Too many try catches are not good for you. <laughs> yeah, not good. Well, aha! If they're not good for you, why do you have me write them? Why do you have me write, catch everything, and then throw it again, as long as you do it in style? <laughs> right? I don't want to do that. So, by the way, so I think that like Herb wrote that, right? And um, he's with me in spirit here, although he's got a bad cold, so. Anywho, so there's something uh, that I don't like here, and when you start liking bad idioms, <laughs> When you start liking go to, you know something's wrong in the kitchen, right? It's, it's clearly, clearly we have a problem here. So, okay, here's my conclusion. I like to generalize, so I say explicit control flow is fail, 
and whatever, right? Great. Do you agree with me? Okay, I'm, I'm a very good salesman. <laughs> All right. So now let's kind of uh, <clears throat> let's turn the, to the let's kind of uh, think about something else for a minute here. Think about like de declarative programming and uh, the tenets of what uh, declarative programming is. Uh, there's all this, I mean, there's, uh, there's all, if you kind of Google for it, you're gonna see that there's a very nice talk about like, oh, you state the objectives of what you're trying to do, and you're, you're you know, you're world peace. I want world peace, and the program is gonna write itself, right? That kind of stuff. <clears throat> but more concretely, there's a bunch of declarative uh, code you write and use on a daily basis. <coughs> Give me examples. SQL, make files, regex. Tem templates. <laughs> That's a heavy one. That's heavy, Doc. <laughs> what else? Uh, make, right? I said it, right? So there's there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of code that we use on a daily basis that's highly specialized, and has this declarative mold to it in which you specify uh, the final objectives, and the mechanics of achieving them are somewhat automatic. And that's pretty awesome. So I kind of uh, like that idea. And um, here's like here's where I had like uh, you know I jumped in the bathtub and I said Eureka, RAII destructors are declarative because you write them but you don't call them. You say well whenever this object goes away, here's the obituary, right? Here's what's going to happen when the guy dies, right? Interesting. You never call it. I mean you can't call it. You know how to call it, right? I told you, you're the best. <laughs> you're the best. You know how to call the destructive, you so want it, right? So, but you usually don't call it, right? Johnson doesn't call it, the guy who drinks under his desk, right? He's not, not calling it, okay? So, okay, interesting. So I, you write, you state what's gonna happen and it happens automatic, semi-automatically, let's say, right? That's very interesting. So let's kind of take that uh, to the 11 and um, extend the same consideration for scope guard. Um, if you search for like scope guard or scope exit, you're gonna find like my previous work from like eons ago. I think it was like the 90s. <laughs> I think it was, maybe it was the 2000, but early, right? We were so much, so much younger and so much more, more you know, idealistic and everything. <laughs> and we weren't married. <laughs> Most of us didn't have kids to worry about, so. Those are the days of scope guard. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Great. So you, you know, there's a macroscope exit which I'm gonna uh, give a few details about, and um, here's how it went. Um, let's look at the macro. So there's a scope exit, and I'm going to. Uh, I took this uh, this statement from our youth to the to the 2015th because. I have this thing at the end of the macro. So first of all, let's start from the end of this macro. What does this guy do? Huh? It doesn't create a lambda that does nothing. It creates uh, the fragment of a lambda that does nothing, right? <laughs> it's worse than that, right? So this kind of starts a lambda, capture everything by reference, start a lambda, and what you need here is the open curly brace. And with the macro, you have a pseudo statement because all of a sudden it's write scope exit, you open a curly brace, you write code, and that code is going to be automatically done when you exit the scope. What do you know? Interesting. Well, and kind of the trickery, uh, the trickery that I'm doing here is I define that enum class at the top, scope guard on exit. Why did I define it for? Just so I have a type. I'm, literally, this is why I define it. So there is a type. It could have been a struct, it could have been anything. Enum class just was at the, on the fingertips there. And it's nice because like mostly blue, two things blue next to each other look great, right? <laughs> so then I define a small template that takes a lambda and adds operator plus of that guy, enum class, the scope guard on exit, and any lambda, and it's gonna just give me the lambda. And then scope exit is going to create an anonymous variable to which I'm gonna get in a minute, which is going to be detail scope guard on exit plus the beginning of the lambda. This plus is going to invoke that guy, and all of a sudden I have the creation of an object that's anonymous. How do you create an anonymous name for an object in C++? 
Who knows? I'm sure some of you know, create an anonymous name, object, a new name in C++. All right, so I'm glad I have the slide. Because no matter what I talk about, I could talk about like rocket surgery, okay? Anything. And at the end of the talk, there's a guy who comes to me and says, you know, that macro thing, how did you do it? <laughs> That's kind of cool, I could use that. The, the templates, whatever, you know, awesomeness, you know, just, and that macro thing, I wanna know all about it. <laughs> I wanna know how it works, man. I, I can use that. All right, here's how it works. So there's a counter thing which all compilers define, and it kind of increments itself every time you use it, but not quite, and I'll, give you a, I'll tell you in a minute why. Yeah, because it, you don't increment it twice in the same use, because otherwise it, this wouldn't work. So it's designed to make this work. Um, so there's an indirection here. So there's an anonymous variable of string, and it's going to call concatenate to string and counter. And concatenate is just going to simply uh, put the, use the two hash preprocessor thing. Why, does, why, is, why do I do that indirection via concatenate? Who knows? Yes? Otherwise, there's like seven stages of doing this crap, right? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, preprocess is like the most complicated thing in the world, right? And among this complication, there's the fact that if you don't do this in direction with concatenate and you're using straight the hash hash operator, it's going to concatenate with the actual symbol underscore underscore counter underscore underscore. And that's what not what we want. You expand that guy first and then concatenate that guy. So what you're gonna get here is whenever you write whatever str the string, it's going to be str1435. And next time you use it, it's gonna be like 1346 and so on, right? So there's a different variable every time, different identifier every time. Getting back to this guy, this anonymous variable is, is going to be called scope exit state followed the, immediately by some number. And every time you use it, it's gonna be a different number. So, um, please, don't come to me after this talk and ask me how this is done. <laughs> like, I know pretty much, I told you everything I know, <laughs> okay? This is where my knowledge of preprocessor ends and wants to end, <laughs> okay? This is where I'm happy. Great. Anywho. Um, the usage looks, looks nice, that's the sort of the upside of this. Because I can open files and scope exit, I'm gonna close files, I'm gonna allocate memory with malloc and scope exit, I'm gonna, you know, free them and everything and, you know, by the way, don't forget to put like a semicolon after the pseudo statement there because otherwise it's gonna, gonna have one of those like very long error messages that we all learn to love, <laughs> right? Okay. So this kind of old stuff, so I don't want to dwell on the old stuff for too long, right? Great. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of getting almost where I want it to be. What we want it, what we want it to be is to have the option to run some code whenever a scope is exited, but remember the examples we gave? It's not whenever the scope ends, but it's only when the scope is exited by an exception. So I just want to do some code when the scope is failing, meaning I enter the scope in good health, like in Doom, you have like 100% health, right? And when you exit it, you're like completely messed up, like the monsters got you, right? So scope fail is going to execute code whenever that is respawn, right? That the scope fail is the code for respawning. You don't play much Doom, do you? <laughs> okay. My jokes were about like internal references don't work. But I want, I want exit and I want fail. And by the way, since we're here, there's a sense of symmetry in all this because I want to execute code no matter what happens when the scope is done. I want to execute code whenever the scope fails. And you know what? I may want to execute code in a celebratory way whenever the code exits nicely. Whenever the scope does not end with an exception. Make sense? So I'm these three guys. I want these three pseudo statements. Exit, fail, and success. Right? 
And actually, in production code, if you, if you look through it, you're gonna find a lot of uses for uh, all of them, but mostly for these two guys. This is more rare. It's, it's, it, it has uses. I'm gonna give uh, more details. All right, <clears throat> so let me kind of emphasize the fact that here we're talking like, the, it's something declarative because I'm stating that you, whenever the scope is, like in, we are like basic, on error, resume next. <laughs> it's awful, but it's declarative, <laughs> right? Remember like, uh, on, on error, go, you know, on error, like do something, print a statement, you know, there was an error and resume next, right? So <clears throat> this is declarative, it's nice because it saves us mechanics. It's, uh, it's expressing goals. I have good news for you. So this is like how my slides evolved. Literally, so first it was like may become portable uh, in the future. And there's like a smaller number here, the proposal and, um, you know, as, and you know, I gave this talk like three times. Four, once was just my mom, but you know, three times, okay? <laughs> so first time it was like with may and you know, I wish, I have a dream, right? The second one was like, oh, there's a proposal, Herb worked on it, right? And today I'm very happy to announce that it's done. It's a done deal. And it's amazing that it's a done deal because all I had to do was write the slides, which I hate, <laughs> give the talk, have Herb listen, and take a vacation. <laughs> he took care of it, which is pretty awesome. <clears throat> all right, so C++17 has it. And uh, here's how they did it. Uh, they went with a principle that's like from the Egyptians, like when in doubt, replace bull with int, <laughs> right? Think of it, a bull is bad, right? Like vector bull, need I say more? <laughs> like bull is awful, right? It's terrible. Huh? That was a cheap shot. That was a cheap <laughs> shot, I agree. All right, so, you know, so they replaced bull with int and they replaced like singular with plural. And there's two effects of this. We have a new function, which is in unquote exceptions. And the second effect is that Google hates that because with Google, like plural and singular are the same thing. So if you search for one, you're gonna find the other. <laughs> so it's kind of messed up right now, but Google is gonna figure it out, right? So you can search for it. You're gonna find like a million results for unquote exceptions, uh, exception. And then you're gonna find, oh, did you mean, Google is gonna Did you mean uh, the singular there? <laughs> you know, so. So, um, you see what I did there? Like, this is a, the comments. Uh, this is like the beginning of a rap song right there. Like, you know, someone, I don't know. Um, well, what does this do? Could someone tell us? Yes, please. The number of exceptions in play. The number of exceptions in play. But how come, I, how is it possible in C++ to have several exceptions flying? Someone else. How is it possible? Yes. Uh, it's uh, an exception thrown in a nested catch. An exception thrown in a nested catch. The execution of the catch itself does not mean the exception has been accounted for yet. And this was a classic failure scenario of the singular version of the function, the one that returned like the awful bull, right? So it was bad. So essentially, like Herb had a full like item in his book about how that's useless, that you know, the singular function is useless and uh, all kinds of bad about it because it's almost like it's working, it's just not, right? So if you try something, it throws and you catch, you catch it and then you try something else inside the catch and it throws again, you don't know what the hero is doing anymore, right? So this is where we are. And uh, Uncaught Exception is going to increment uh, that counter whenever a new, Exception is thrown, right? Um, question for you. Um, can I leave a scope with a smaller exception count than when I entered? So I enter a scope, I execute some code, and then when the scope is left, can the unquote exception count be smaller? Yes. yes. If there's a bug in the compiler, <laughs> yes, right? 
the scope, the scope should be like a scope that doesn't throw, it's gonna pre conserve the number of exceptions there, right? There's nothing that can be erased inside the scope. You can kind of enter a different scope and et cetera, right? Or you can exit that scope. But within the given scope, you can't, that, that number can't go down. Can it go up? Oh yeah, right? By how much? By one. That's just, you enter a scope and when you exit it, it just can throw one exception, right? From that particular scope, right? Okay. But then when you enter nested scopes, you can have like larger numbers of this exception count, right? Can it be negative? I hope not. Yeah, it could be if there's a bug in the compiler, right? Okay, great. By the way, they didn't make it unsigned because, oh, come on, unsigned. It's like, I see you're the best, so tell that to Johnson, okay? All right, explain. You tried last week and didn't work out. He was drinking too heavily. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> well, let's use this guy. Um, and this is like, essentially like the way that I think is supposed to be used. Um, I advocated for it by using this example and this is like, essentially this is the only known use of that function. <laughs> I'm not kidding, there's no other use that's meaningful. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. Hmm. Uh, first of all, like notice that this like no except is blue, so I updated my LaTeX to account for C++ 11 and beyond, right? So um, I'm called exception counter. I have a little class that all it does it counts how many exceptions are in the scope of it and leaving the scope of it. So when initialize the when you initialize by default this uh, this guy, it's going to save the exception count by calling unquote exceptions. And it has a method that tells me, you know, do, are, are you throwing a new exception? Is a new exception leaving the scope of this class? So this is sort of the basic, um, the basic wrapper around the unquote exception that is useful. <clears throat> I want to save it when I enter my scope and I want to consult it when I'm leaving the scope. And that's all I want to do. Okay? Great. Um, so far, so good? Okay. So now let's kind of, um, uh, this, it's, I, I'm giving the talk. There should be some templates somewhere. So it's in, inevitable. So let's see. Well, we have a template that takes a lambda and a Boolean that tells me whether or not I want to execute this an exception. Remember, we talked about scope success and scope fail. In scope fail, if there's an exception I want to throw, in scope success, I don't want to throw. So that's that Boolean. I want to reuse the code across the two. So then we have, we keep the lambda and we, we keep the unquote exception counter, which I ju we just defined as the slide before. We initialize the, fun the lambda, all that move uh, stuff, and you know, what's interesting is this, the destructor. When the destructor gets executed, I'm looking at the counter. Did the scope generate a new exception? And if that is exactly what I want, I'm going to call the lambda. Otherwise, I'm not going to. So if this guy is, so this, like, execute an exception is like a constant Boolean, right? And if I do want to execute an exception, this guy is gonna be true, and if true equals uh, the new exception is being generated, I'm going to call the lambda, otherwise I won't. So I'm going to reuse this class for a function and uh, for uh, success and failure. Uh, by the way, uh, you notice like the nice conditional use of no except? Like, no except I takes a Boolean, right? Okay, let's, let's, talk, let's dwell on this guy for 30 seconds because it's well worth it. If a function fails, if I'm throwing an exception, and then I want to throw, like, while the exception is flying, I want to execute something that's also throwing an exception, what's gonna happen? STD terminate, sudden death, right? So, you know, in that, I mean, that's kind of bad. I mean, it's, I don't care, it's terminate. So I may as well claim that the lambda is no except. So I'm gonna write that that's a no except. You see, what, you see what I'm saying? If a guy wants to go kamikaze, what's the purpose in giving them a helmet? <laughs> right, because a helmet would be like, there's no no except, it could throw conceptually. 
it's his right to throw an exception. But in this case, I, if this guy wants to go, I'm, I'm not going to waste a helmet on that guy. <laughs> right? Just save it. Keep it. That's no except there. Remember, whenever I see that no except, helmet. Okay? <laughs> Great. But if I don't want to execute an exception, so if I want to execute on success, I may as well generate an exception. There's no harm in doing so. Because the scope is about to exit with success. And there may be a guy who doesn't like success. <laughs> fear of success, like the fifth fear in the United States, right? Like, amazing. How, who would be afraid of success, right? It turns out they are like, right? But, you know, and this is it. Great. Does this make sense so far? Are you getting bored here? Okay, well, I'm, I'm getting there, but I got to keep on doing this, right? So then now it's like the 30 minutes into the talk, and I'm like, oh, they didn't leave yet. <laughs> All right, so this is the icing on the cake. I'm going to uh, define a new macro. Let me see if I have the macro here. Yeah, there it is. So <clears throat> um, remember, like, Enum class, and I'm going to do the same for the scope guard on fail. So I define a new type. I'm doing the lambda, I'm doing the operator plus. I'm doing the, you know, there's a std decay in there because it didn't use Colgate, right? <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, and I have the operator plus that's going to uh, help me define this macro. So scope fail. Scope fail introduces an anonymous variable. That anonymous variable is the, you know, it, it's that object constructed plus the beginning of a lambda, and by the way, I put the helmet there. Right, the lack of a helmet, right? No except. Because if I fail, again, I may as well say it's no except. You're not entitled to throw from us something that fails and actually care about it. You can't throw. You can't come to me about it. <laughs> you can't you blame me. Oh, Andre, what's the no except? I thought you're a good guy, right? <laughs> I am a good guy. I'm not giving you a helmet. <laughs> All right. Make sense? All righty then. So let's see what the aftermath is here. That's a hurry on time here. Okay, great. Transactional copy. Create a temporary file name. Should anything go bad, declarative, right? Should anything go bad, Remove the temporary, copy the file, and rename the destination. And this time, every line in the function is meaningful. It does work. It gets work done. It's interesting. There's no throwing and catching and, you know, there's just, I'm stating what should happen. Should anything bad happen, let me delete the temporary created. And that's totally fine, right? So uh, do you agree that this is better than what we had before? You may as well not, but I mean, but I got the microphone, so who cares? <laughs> okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Transactional move. You know, here, like, what's interesting is that the sequence of uh, operations matters. Remember, like, we had that try, and re depending on where you put a try and the scoping of things, all that control flow was meaningful because it's kind of in important, but in a mechanical way. Here, all I need to do is kind of order the operations appropriately, and we're done. Like, first, I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do in a transactional move, by the way, so this assumes you're not on the same file system because our is are cheaper. So remember, I have an extra restriction. All of my code has to enter, fit in one slide. I'm not kidding. So all I write, it's got to be simple enough so it fits on a slide. Because otherwise, of course, the question is like, what if from and to are equal? What if they're in the same file system? Why do you copy like an idiot, something on the, in the same directory? Etc. So all of these, I assume, are kind of elsewhere, right? So I'm focusing on the core matter here. Uh, but don't, I mean, don't think I'm an idiot. Although, I mean, you could, because I might. But, you know, <laughs> at least of this, I'm aware of. Okay, let me put it that way. 
So, okay, we have uh, boost files is in copy, uh, sorry, that's not boost, the copy paste error. That's not in boost file, file system, copy file transact. I wrote it in the slide before this, right? So copy file transact from two. So first thing I'm doing, I make sure that I have a copy of the file. This is like the fundamental thing I want to do here as the first step. And regardless, I want to get that done. And they, that guy throws that fine. And second, I'm going to put a stake in the ground saying, well, if what follows fails, I want to make sure that I'm removing the destination, right? And then I'm going to remove the source. So, uh, and actually, this is like kind of simpler even if you have like if and else and stuff like if you write it in C, it's actually more complicated than this, which is pretty interesting because you, everybody thinks like that's the easiest way, but declar declarative is, is easier than the easiest way because it, you just say what should happen and it's all flat and nice. Right? Awesome. Let's see. Well, <clears throat> This is kind of a reiteration of the helmet argument. Yes. Oh my God, whenever I hear that, <laughs> that doesn't bode well. Yes, the scope fail, if I, if I move it before, yeah, right, you, you remove the destination like kind of compulsively and wrongly, you shouldn't, right? So yeah, it does matter where you put it. So, and the sequence does matter. And that, that's a good thing, because you can achieve several things. Sorry? Copy file is transactional. Is transactional. So if that guy throws, I don't care. I don't need to do anything, because it kind of took care of itself in its own way, right? So that's great. All right. So. Uh, let's see, we're about three right now. We have scope success, we have scope fail, and we have scope exit. So scope success, I said, you know, if the scope is left with success, this guy could initiate an exception. It's the right, because no exception has been initiated yet, so it does not still terminate all that bad business, right? Um, scope fail can, should not throw an exception. That would be the kamikaze thing to do. Save the helmet, put no exception in, Document it, assume the guy's not never gonna throw an exception because that would be really bad, right? Scope exit. Should could it throw or could it not? Sometimes. So scope exit is like a destruct, it's invoked whenever, whenever the scope is left, is gonna be executed, right? So the fact that whether it throws or not is statically indeterminate. So you go conservative. A vote conservative, right? <laughs> so you, you go, you, you say, I don't know whether this guy is gonna throw or not dynamically, so what I can say is that statically I can't tell, so I'm going to assume the worst, right? Great, so only this guy may throw, and you may want to reflect that in the respective signatures. So here are a few examples from, actually from derived from production code that I've seen, and uh, um, they're great, I like, I like them. So one is like post conditions, string to int. Well, on success, I'm going to make sure that the com converting the integer back to string is, is good, right? It gives you the same string, right? So post condition verifier. And notice that it only does it on when the scope is exit with success. If it does a failure, it wouldn't execute. Very concise. Changing of the guard. Well, uh, this is a bit uh, low level, but really this is like the fastest way of lexing anything. If you're on a lex, a if you're on a lex code, this is like the f there's no faster way, except if you go assembler, right? And the way you go is uh, you take the pointer to the buffer, you have the size there, and uh, what you do is you replace the last character in the buffer with a known terminator like in this case, 255. And then you write a, a big switch. You do, for every character, you kind of do a big switch. And inside that switch, you have a case 255, which means I reach the end of the buffer. What is the speed advantage of this code as opposed to 
kind of a four, a non-infinite four, four until, you know, for i equals zero up to len, I'm going to do something with the current character. What is the advantage? Who can tell? Yes, that left. No, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. There's no choice, there's no choice. Yeah, but there is an if inside the switch, right? So that, that I'm making the choice still. Yes. The switch is a table lookup. I would generalize that. I mean, it, you don't know whether it's a table lookup or not, or not, but you do know the following. The, essentially, like, switch is optimized for, I'm going to choose one of many things, and often it does turn out to be a table, but, you know, some other times it's like, a, you know, a series of jumps or whatnot, right? But what I know from this is that most of, more often than not, the code is optimized for sort of the cost of each one choice in the switch is divided by the number of total choices. I have a switch of 100 branches. I could think the cost of testing one guy out of these 100 is somehow a fraction of the cost of testing each. Am I making sense? In the table thing, this is obvious. In the table approach, it's a wall of one lookup, right? And the cost of testing for anything is the same and small, right? Whereas if you put an if at the top, if you put like a loop at the top, you're going to test that guy first, and then you're gonna do a switch. So you have like two tests going on. I have one inside the switch, and I have an extra one telling me whether or not I got to the end. This is like 5x, I'm not kidding. This could be like, if you write a simple lexer, even for C++ itself, if you write a simple lexer, this could make a huge difference. But of course I want to preserve the last character, because at the end of this guy here, at the end of the loop, what if it was a different character that was meaningful to the program, right? And I want to handle that guy separately. It's no performance cost to me because it's the last one. It's, I'm doing that work once, right? But the nice thing is that um, here with scope exit, I get to kind of save the, put the character back in the buffer automatically. Make sense? All right, by the way, there's a kind of a bit of dirt in this. There's no, the buffer is not const. So even though I'm supposed to just look at it, I mean, I put a const there, I put after a pointer just to mess with you all, <laughs> right? So you know, let me put a const there, see what they say. And nobody said anything, so, right? So, yes. When do you process the character that you temporarily overwrote? At the end of the switch statement. It's a one-time work. And you know what? In there, often you find yourself using a go-to and you go to inside the for loop somewhere, right? It's kind of weird. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not above using go-to, right? All right. <clears throat> uh, scope change. This is, again, from production code. Um, there's a global Boolean that tells me whether I'm sweeping or doing something or not, clean up. And I'm setting true, whenever the scope is exited by any means, I'm going to set sweeping to false, and then I'm going to do stuff. Um, how could I do this with a destructor? Yeah, so you kind of create a little object with a boolean inside, and it has a constructor and destructor, and I call it like, I know, um, a sweep guy, sweep sweeper, right? And it's a singleton probably, and it needs to be visited, right? And it, the bull is not good, so you want an int there. And, you know, it becomes like a project, right? So you don't want that. You don't want to create a new type just for this thing. So you just use scope exit and you're done, right? Great. All right. Uh, this is, again, from production code. Uh, there's, I had to call, call flock, lock and unlock things. And there's no type, there's no, there's, there's, boost has nothing for it, right? So you look in boost and there's nothing, so how do you use it? Or do I have to sit down and write a new type? No, I don't have to because in two lines I'm done. Right? Scope exit. Very easy. Of course, if you want to do this systematically, I would advise you to make this an abstraction, say file lock and make it an object and write the R value constructors and all those good things, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly, you want to, if, if you're committed to it, right? Okay. So there's a, there's a thing, a thread going through this uh, in which all examples I gave 
have some declarative bent to, to them. They're not that imperative. Because they specify goals and contingencies and actions. They don't specify when the actions are going to be executed. They're going to just specify that these should be done should things happen. Should the scope be exited? Should the scope be exited via an exception? Should the scope be exited via uh, um, anyhow, right? So that's nice. Uh, in production, we, not, we notice that if you start using scope, you're not going to need try that much and catch and all of that baseball game, right? There's not much need for it anymore, which is great. Uh, the nicest thing that I like is uh, that the flow becomes flat. So, you know, if you're like me, you like code that sticks to the left side of the window, right? I'm not kidding. So it's nice to have, like, low complexity that way. Because, for example, like, think of this. If you indent too much, then you start fighting with your coworkers. What's the maximum columns? <laughs> right? And there, there goes a holy word, like, forever, right? <laughs> Instead, you say, you know what? Just you know, stick your code to the left-hand side and you're gonna be fine. And all is good, so no more worse. Um, and the order of introducing things matters. This is unlike certain declarative code. By the way, in a make file, um, not always, but this is make. I mean, it's, it's not systematic, right? <laughs> but in a make file, it's not, it's not supposed to be even like understood by humans. I think. <laughs> But some, often, sometimes often, <laughs> um, it doesn't matter what order you put things in your make file, right? Except when it does, but, right? Um, and there's also like other declarative languages um, in which it really doesn't matter the order in which you specify things. For example, in a regex, if you have like alternatives with the pipe, it doesn't matter what order you put the alternatives in. It's just not going to be the same thing, right? And so on. So in an SQL, if, when you select things, oh, it's, well, if you specify join, it does matter, etc. But by and large, operations are not sequence dependent as much. But in this case, this is a bit more imperative. It does matter what order I put things in, right? All right. <clears throat> well, so uh, there's one detail left to. Uh, uh, to uh, figure out, like, this is from the future, like, you know, we come from the future when we say, uh, yeah, it's C++ 17, but the year is 2015. And uh, what the, where are we doing for that minus two delta here, right? And here I have good news. I'm seeing, like, STL smiling wryly, and I'm, not, I'm seeing Chandler, like, kind of nodding there. I go, I hate this guy. <laughs> OK. So the nice thing is that even before C17, unquote exception had reached the first cosmic speed. You know that, uh, you know, the cosmic speeds and everything. I would say in, in C, the first cosmic speed is, thank you. The, the first cosmic speed means there is a major corporation that implements and maintains this code. This is the first cosmic speed. If there's a guy who in his free time does it and takes care of it, that's not off the ground. It doesn't take us to space, right? It gets into the orbit once there's a major corporation kind of taking care of it. And there is. Facebook. Facebook Folly has had, um, for a while actually, in GitHub, it's had this Folly library, and inside the Folly library, there's a scope guard header, which contains whatever the hell it takes to do it on GCC. Marshall, give me a second here. I, I get to you. <laughs> and I realize, I mean, this should be spelled Marshall Clo, but Villa was the first one I found. And at the end, at the end it should say for class. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, great. So at the end, it should say for Clang. So here's the thing. It's all Google's fault. Because whenever I search for the plural, it gives me the, the singular. And I don't know who did what and when, OK? So I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm serious. I'm going to ask you to, uh, to intervene at a specific point. 
Um, so first of all, first I heard there's this guy, Evgeny, who actually wrote, before it was done, before it was even proposed, he wrote this thing. So he saw my talk and he wrote that library which does some magic to make it work on MSVC and on GCC. And probably on Clang because GCC and Clang have a lot of similarities in, in the, the, their ABIs. So, uh, so this guy kind of wrote it and kind of took care of it, but it wasn't the first cosmic speed. There's a guy, right? Great, but he wrote me email and he said, you know, I wrote this, I'm taking care of it and this is awesome. So his code is like a lot of cast and a lot of magic constant. And probably if you change your white space, it's gonna go blow to hell, right? <laughs> but it works. Great. So then we took, uh, we took Evgeny's code and we went, I, went, I went to the Facebook folks and I said, you know, folks, we gotta do this because you look at these casts and this ugliness, this is awesome. <laughs> okay, we gotta be on top of that, right? So okay, so uh, Daniel took it and kind of put it in folly and since then Facebook maintains folly and therefore maintains scope guard. So we're kind of there, right? We're spinning around the globe. First cosmic speed. Second cosmic speed, Herb. As I said, all I had to do was to Herb was, Herb, here's how the code looks, should be. And Herb said, well, well, I'll make it happen and I'm really sorry if I offended you. <laughs> He's Canadian. So. <laughs> So I, I realize I'm not speaking Canadian very well, but I tried to. Okay. <clears throat> so, and then Michael, whose last name I didn't get, and he must be in this room here, implemented for Visual Studio 2015. My name is James. My name is James. James. <laughs> James. <laughs> Let's go to James. I swear there's a guy, Michael, next to Herb, and my understanding of the exchange was that uh, he did it. <laughs> but thanks, James and? McNellis. James McNellis, thank you very much. 2015, it's, it's in production, it, you have it. If you use Windows, right? If you have it, okay? So you have uncode exceptions. You can, you can take my slides and write the code and see it not work. Okay, <clears throat> so we have it in Visual Studio. We have it for GCC. Uh, and Marshall, this is like the moment you kind of tell us what, what's happened. Clank 3.7 has it. Um, who, who knows the GCC story? Which version of GCC has it? I couldn't figure out. It's, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it. There's a lot of patches. There's a lot of code. It's done. I'm, I'm not sure which version. So what I did, I was like, you know, I tried it in Ubuntu, whatever the hell I have, and it didn't work, and I said, well, let me Google, and Google then messed it up, right? <laughs> so I don't know, some GCC has it. Probably 5.2. Five, five, That's like, after kind of looking through the everything, and kind of like in Matrix, like looking through the, you know, blonde brunette, whatever, I saw it was 5.2 was the answer, because somebody said in a discussion, oh, it's gonna come after 5.1. <laughs> So with my like magic powers there, 5.2 should be it, right? Great. Awesomeness. So um, I should, like Marshall Close name should be there because he wrote a bunch of code for Clang. Is, is that, that's you, right? Yeah. Okay, so he's the author of the patch and everything. And uh, essentially what I'm saying here is like you have, you have some non-standard stuff in Folly already done. With ScopeGuard, it's everything is there, the macros. Anonymous variable is in there. Don't come and ask me. It's there. <laughs> it's it, come do go look. Okay, hunt. Do look for it. Um, so you have the non-standard thing with scope X and everything. You have it in the standard by thank you, Herb, very much. Um, and I'm sorry if I offended you. We like James did it for Visual uh, Visual Studio 2015, so it's already there, even though there is not yet 2017 which is great. All right, any question before we summarize? Yes. How do you deal with API that is not using transactions, especially looking at uh, the fail code and still fail? How do you deal with, with code that doesn't care about transactions? Uh, 
Uh, so code could still conceptually fail, but not by throwing an exception. These are, this doesn't, doesn't cover that. So everything it does is predicated on a notion that exceptions are failure and lack of exceptions are success. So it doesn't apply. Yes. Scope exit can't throw. Can't. Cannot. No, sir, it cannot throw. Cannot throw. It could. Um, well, it depends uh, how, what you consider good and bad here. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Sure. Ah, okay. <laughs> so. I love this. This become, And they're always in the last row there. Like the best questions come from the last row and by a guy who has like an accent as bad as mine. And just, I don't, okay, so, loud. Microphone, thank you. No, let, let him. Uh, we could uh, thro uh, throw from scope exit before. Is, is that right? We could throw from a scope exit before. Why is it okay? Uh, why is it not okay anymore? Yes. Okay. Um, it was not okay to throw from scope exit before. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. So there's this article. I'm, I'm, I think I know what you're getting at. There's this article, and I allowed, like in my initial work, when I was young, had no money, and you do what you have to do, right? <laughs> so I said, you know what, in a scope exit, if you feel like it, you can throw, because it's possible that you know, the scope is not actually exited by an exception. So you could have a conditional in there that throws. So the code could be dynamically correct. But in, you know, in this version, when I grew and I became more wise and right or whatever, older definitely, right? So now I'm saying, you know what? In scope you gotta be conservative. You don't want to take risks anymore because you're not young any longer. <laughs> so my answer to your question is, it was not okay for scope to throw before and it's not okay today. Thank you. Uh, so question. Yes. I... Okay. Uh huh. If you have multiple scope exit clauses, what's going to happen there? No, they're going to exit not one after the other. It's, it's going to be, your calls are going to be answered in the reverse order they arrived, which would be a weird policy for Comcast, but I would love it, right? <laughs> so your calls are going to be answered the other way around. And more interestingly, you could have scope exit and scope success and scope fail kind of there. And they're going to interact weirdly because what if you have a scope success and it throws an error and then you have scope fail? So you know what? Homework. <laughs> Exercise for the attendee. This is awesome. Uh, yes. Counter, I think, is a higher extension. Is there any work to make it part of the standard? Counter is a part of, is a compiler extension. Can it be made part of the, uh, the C++ standard? Um, you know what, I'll root uh, Chandler, where, where are you? Okay, Chandler. He's like, what the, I, okay, so, okay, so that means no. I think it's like <laughs> international sign language for no. In, counter is a recipe for ODR violations. Counter is a recipe for ODR, ODR violations. violations. In, in One definition rule. Oh, but not in this case, not, in, not on my slides, my friend, okay? <laughs> Let's make that clear. So I think counter is like one of those things do in which... Use, do you use your stuff in an inline function? Do you use your stuff in an inline function? Do you use scoped card in an inline function? Why not? Ever. Well, it's in the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> then you have an ODR violation. Okay. Huh. Uh, Okay, well, you, I told you no refunds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that.
All right. Uh, there is one more caveat that is maybe more subtle than this, which, which goes like this. Um, you could have like a return that doesn't move from an, from an L value in the scope, and if you have scope exit, depending on what's in the, your scope, it may find the value already moved from. So actually, there, there's a gentleman who emailed me about it, and he said, well, there's a problem here, because in C++ 98, that couldn't happen. And I routed that to Howard Hinnant, and he said, oh, that was actually possible in C++ 98 as well, so it's an old problem. So if you have like, even if, if you have a destructor that depends on what's in the scope, you, it may find like um, data that has been already moved from. So that, that's, a, that's a known danger to some extent. Um, any, I think we have time for minus one question. Last question, I swear. Yes, standing. Ah, okay. Is this essentially what you have in the D language, or there is something Is this better? what we have in the D language? Yes. So these three uh, are actually statements in, the, in D, yes. I hate macros. Is there any way to do it without macros? Is there any way to do it without macros? Um, well, why? Macros are fun. <laughs> Um, well, so th there's an idiom that's, uh, so scope guard, you can use scope guard without a macro, and you can use like a minimum, you know, without all that operator plus nonsense, right? You can use things, uh, but you gotta kind of give them names, and people do like put an underscore there, right, for the name. And then if like two, you have like, you, well, you have two underscores, I guess, right? Or you put an underscore and one and stuff like that. Yes, Chandler. That does fix the ODR violation. That does fix the ODR <laughs> violation, so. It may be in luck. And by the way, under underline doesn't have the same problem, does it? Sure. Okay, so I'm nods. Everybody nods. ISL for nods means no, right? Great. Yes. <laughs> Louder? Yeah, so if you have like two on the same, but those shall not put two statements on the same line. <laughs> C++ core guidelines. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's in the book, right? Awesome. Okay, I'm 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 loving this, but we, we gotta summarize at some point here. <laughs> Thanks very much.